whether you're in person. Quick announcement right here at the top for our Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening to everybody. Um, Gustavo and I, and my name is Angelina, are offering Spanish interpreting services. So please bear with me for one second while I make an answer for Spanish for everybody. Eh, bienvenidos a todos, espero que estén muy bien. Tenemos servicios de interpretación, así que si prefieren escuchar en español, por favor, déjenos saber. Tenemos un equipo atrás para ofrecerle. Y también los que están en línea también pueden conectarse al servicio de interpretación. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, thank you. That's all. Thank you. 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 Thank So my name is Alex Adrian. I work at the LGBTQ Center here in Durham as an operations manager. We work to create a community where all LGBTQ plus lived experiences are affirmed, supported, and celebrated. Well, you folks should have the opportunity to reach their personal goals and live their lives with authenticity. We are very glad to be able to partner with the City of Durham's Neighborhood Improvement Services Human Division to bring people together for this chance to share and learn. For those on Zoom, please feel free to leave your questions in the chat box and we will be sure to address them. For folks here in person, please raise your hand or write your comments on the note card. We will try to address as many as we can tonight. There are no cards outside if you need note cards, please raise your hand for them. Yeah. Virtually and in person, we have Spanish translation available. In person, there are headsets you may use, and on Zoom, there's a translation feature, both for ASL and Spanish. Please select and load in the box. Additionally, the Rainbow Collective for Change is offering activities for children during this morning in the computer lab directly across the hall from this. And for those interested, light refreshments are available in the back of the room. Please don't hesitate to get up. And make yourself for it. To begin tonight's discussion, the first person you will hear from is Constance Stansel. She is the director of the City of Durham's Neighborhood Improvement Services. I hope today's conversation begins with the process of us helping someone else live their best and most authentic life. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Okay, I'll speak loud. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Yesterday, we celebrated the life and accomplishments of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. His legacy is one of unity, diversity, and equity. One of the greatest privileges we have in the Department of Neighborhood Improvement Services is to host this wonderful and we hope engaging. <clears throat> An enlightening forum, the LGBTQIA plus this discussion <laughs> forum. <laughs> yes, want to make sure I got that right. Mm -hmm. This event and others like this afford us the opportunity to collaborate with Durham partners and agencies to ensure that diversity, inclusion, and equity is an integral part of our community. We are comprised of individuals so connected that as one succeed, we all succeed. My success is your success. Desmond Tutu said it best. My humanity is bound up in yours, but we can only be human together. Tonight, we welcome you. We welcome your participation and engagement as we explore how we can protect residents and youth in the city of Durham against discrimination and on the uh, discrimination on bias of gender, identity and sexual orientation. The next person you will hear will be Cheryl McDonald, who works with me in the Department of Neighborhood Improvement Services. And I wanna leave you with this. May our sense of humanity and community continue to make German equitable and inviting and welcome place to live. Thank you, Constance. Hello, everyone. Tonight, we'll be discussing sensitive topics about how we identify ourselves and live our lives. We encourage you to listen with an ear of understanding, to accept and expect that not every problem will be solved tonight. This conversation is only the beginning of the work we must all do. Please remember to speak with empathy and respect. 
For those attending online, we have someone monitoring the Zoom chat box for questions. So feel free to leave your questions. And for those attending in person, feel free, like Alex said, to write your questions on an index card and pass them to Ms. Latoya Blackwell Battle, and we'll try to respond to every question. We also encourage you to speak from your own perspective. No panelist, participant, or attendee is speaking on behalf of the group or any organization. Our panelists and other and moderator are sharing from their personal understanding of the laws, policies, and practices in their area of expertise. No one person has all the answers, but if we cannot answer your questions tonight, we'll take your information and look for resources that address your concerns. I have the pleasure of introducing today's moderator, Mr. Sidney Williams Black. Sid is a Black transgender man and a native of Durham, North Carolina. He attended college in Roanoke, Virginia, where he graduated graduated in 2018 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in film. Sid is married to his college sweetheart and they parent two children. He currently works at Nicholson Fan PLLC, where he is a legal assistant. Sid enjoys helping others in the community, particularly trans and gender non-conforming clients. And we will now pass the mic to his capable friends. Thank you. Welcome to the LGBTQIA discussion forum. You will hear from our panelists on this sensitive yet timely subject focusing on our community and our youth. Tonight's panelists come from diverse backgrounds and have unique insights on our community. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to introduce each of our panelists. Sophia Hernandez is an assistant city attorney for the city of Durham. She was born in Honduras and immigrated to the U.S. at the age of seven. Sophia earned her bachelor's degree at Seattle University and her Juris Doctorate at Duke University School of Law. Sophia is a senior lecturing fellow at Duke University School of Law, teaching legal writing and contract drafting. She also served as Durham City Attorney Office's intern extern program coordinator. Sophia enjoys working with law students and helping mentor the next generation of diverse and municipal attorneys. Her work focuses on public safety, code enforcement, enforcement against fair housing, employment, and public accommodation discrimination. She will be able to answer your legal questions and explain how Durham's non-discriminatory discriminative nation ordinance protects Durham's residents, workers, and visitors. Quick caveat, not all legal questions will I be able to answer. Just wanted to limit <laughs> expectations. <laughs> Demetrius Via is a diversity practitioner who serves as the director of diversity, equality, and inclusion at Triangle Day School. She began her educational career as a middle school math teacher and DEI coordinator at Henderson Collegiate in Henderson, North Carolina. She then joined Triangle Day School as the wide math specialist and academic advisor. She believes that not only can all students learn, but they can succeed. Demetrius uses her ability to build connections with students and families to push the envelope on social norms. Demetrius earned her bachelor's and master's degree at North Carolina a and University. Demetrius is a Durham native and a fierce social justice advocate for marginalized groups. Tonight, she brings her expertise on how to foster diversity in a private school setting. Emily Chavez is a member of Durham Public School Board of Education and has over 15 years of experience as an education professional. Over the course of her career, she has been an advocate for social justice and education and worked to create opportunities for equitable education access, particularly for students of color, undocumented students, and LGBTQ plus students. She has taught middle school, high school, and undergraduate students, as well as led professional development on Latin American and Caribbean studies for teachers around the state of North Carolina. Emily holds a bachelor's from Swarthmore. College, an MAT from Duke University, 
and an MFA in creative writing from North Carolina State University. She is currently a full-time student in the MSW program at UNC Chapel Hill and a Weiss Urban Livability Fellow. Born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, she has lived in Durham for over 18 years. Emily will be able to provide information on diversity and inclusion efforts being made in public schools. While they each serve the community, our panelists will speak from their personal knowledge and understanding of policies and ordinance affecting our community. They share from their hearts and minds. Today, they do not speak for the city of Durham or any institution. While none of us can solve every problem, we hope tonight we are able to answer your questions and leave you with resources that can help. As a reminder, the chat is open for questions and there will be a lot of time at the end for questions. Our first question is, how does Durham's non-discrimination ordinance protect the rights of LGBTQIA plus individuals and advocates in the community? That one's me. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be a panelist this evening. Uh, it's great to see folks here and online um, present for this important discussion. And of course, I'm happy to discuss the protections that our non-discrimination ordinance provides. But first, because I'm a lawyer and a legal professor, I want to start with a little bit of history and background of kind of like how we got here. So um, first, I want to take a moment to talk about the legal complex or the complexities of our legal system, right? There's a lot of layers and sources of law regarding these issues, right? So we've got, you know, the supreme law of the land, the federal, con you know, the U.S. Constitution. Then we have federal laws. Then we have the state constitution. And then we have state laws. And then we have counties because counties are subdivisions of states. And then we have cities down here. So um, when we, as public servants of the, of, city of, of the city of Durham, of residents of the city of Durham, ask ourselves or get asked the question, what can you do to help? How can you protect us? We kind of have to, especially us as lawyers, go through all those layers to determine whether there are any federal, state, or county laws that prohibit or minimize our ability to act, protect, and enforce. So I want you, as you're discussing these things, to kind of keep those layers in mind, because often we look to our local public servants because they're closest to us to, you know, be able to act, but we are somewhat hindered by all those layers. So just wanted to kind of lay that out there, right? So case in point, for those of you who lived in North Carolina for a while, you may remember that the General Assembly in 2016 passed, passed what was known as the bathroom bill. Can I get some nods? Do folks remember that, right? That was a law that, among other things, required folks to only use the bathroom in, in correlation with the sex assigned to them at birth. Um, it also barred cities and municipalities from enacting any other anti-discrimination protections. So it basically said the, the protections that exist now, cities and counties, you can expand them, right? So if we're looking at those layers, the state told the cities that they couldn't do any more, that they couldn't expand protections. It tied our hands. Now, of course, in 2017, because there was this national business community backlash because of that law, like, I don't know if you remember the NF, you know, sports commissions and Nike and all these people got an uproar, great. Um, and the city, excuse me, the state lost billions of dollars in revenue. General Assembly didn't like that. So they then responded by 2017 and acting which was called HB2, which they considered a, a compromise law arguable, of course. What they didn't compromise on is they kept that prohibition. They kept saying, cities, counties, you cannot enact any more anti-discrimination laws until December 2020. So from 2017 to 2020, municipalities, I want to say across the, the state, not all of them, but many municipalities and counties were sort of waiting for that expiration date, hoping that when that happened, they could enact local laws that better reflected the values of our community. And that's what happened. We saw a lot of these local laws enacted across the state. Durham's law was enacted in January 2021, a month after that expiration of that moratorium. So that's what we're here to talk about today, that law. 
So um, we passed the law and it expanded our anti-discrimination protections beyond fair housing to also include protection anti against discrimination in public accommodation settings, as well as in employment settings. We also expanded the protected classes, categories, if you will, um, of folks who are who would be protected, right? So in federal law and state law, there are six classes or groups of folks that are protected. And that's like race, religion, national origin, familial status. I have to look down, I am so sorry. Disability and sex are the, generally the six protected classes. Our ordinance goes beyond that and also protects for military status, sexual orientation, gender identity, and protected hairstyle. So we passed the ordinance in 2021. Soon after passing the ordinance, we wanted to put some teeth behind it. So the city, um, our city council approved uh, more creation of, of jobs, if you will, or of employment to task folks in the city, some of the great folks that are here today to intake complaints and investigate those complaints to, again, uphold and enforce and protect our own residents against these discriminations. So let's see. Uh, so what does this mean more concretely? So for LGBTQIA plus employees, that means that if your employer discriminates against you in hiring, tenure, conditions, privileges, or anything really directly related to your employment because you are one of those in one of those protected groups, your employer is acting unlawfully under our local ordinance. And if that happens, we certainly encourage you, or if you think that's happening, to contact the great folks at the Human Relations Division. Again, they are authorized under this ordinance to intake your complaint, to fully investigate it, to request records from your employer, um, and to try to settle the complaint. If a settlement is possible, right, we also recognize that some of these things, a resolution is not as easy as can be. So if it can't settle, it lands on my desk and the city attorney's office has the authority to file a lawsuit against that employer on your behalf, on the resident's behalf. So that is our protections regarding the employment setting regarding public accommodations. And I know that that's kind of a weird term, but what we mean by that is public accommodations are those places that are generally open to the public. Malls, museums, movie theaters, restaurants, right? Generally you can kind of walk into those. Sometimes there's of course like an entrance fee, like a movie theater, but generally open to the public. So that's what we mean by public accommodations. So for members of the LGBTQIA plus community, that feel that they've been discriminated in a public accommodations, our ordinance also protects you against that, or I, says, I guess enforces against that discrimination. So if you feel that you've experienced that, we again encourage you to reach out to the Durham Human Relations uh, Commission. These folks are dedicated and trained in this work. They'll investigate the complaint. And again, if they find that a discriminatory act occurred, that lands on my desk at the city attorney's office, and we can file a lawsuit again in, on your behalf. So you're with me so far, get some head nods, awesome. This is where it gets tricky. Remember those layers, right? So as I mentioned, layers, federal laws up here. Federal law says that public schools are not places of public accommodation. So that means that they, uh, sorry, they're not public accommodations. They're considered government entities or public entity. Kind of makes sense, right? The part of the government. But unfortunately, what that means is that our local non discrimination uh, ordinance is not enforced or cannot be enforceable within the public schools. Cities cannot govern what counties do, right? Because counties are up a layer, and state law gives counties the authority to conduct the day-to-day -day businesses of schools. So city, the lower layer, can't tell counties how to do their business, their school business. And unfortunately, um, I, I looked really hard, I promise. I was just like, oh, there must be something out there. But unfortunately, there is no statewide um, non-discrimination law that's going up, that applies to public accommodations or public schools for students. Um, that's not the same with non-public schools, as I'm sure we'll hear about. That is a different story, and our ordinance can be enforced in private schools, except <laughs> there are some religious exceptions. Again, because of the federal law. Um, it isn't clear whether charter schools are public accommodations, though I'm inclined 
to say that they would fall under our ordinance because of the little governance that the government has on their day-to-day -day activities. But again, the law isn't 100% clear. So ultimately, whether it's employment or public accommodations, if you think your complaint or someone's complaint that you're close to you might fall under our ordinance, please give us a call. If our folks don't have jurisdiction, if we don't have jurisdiction, we'll certainly connect you to other resources or entities that might. For example, for public schools, the Department of Education Civil Rights Office um, handles complaints regarding discrimination in that setting. One last note uh, for allies generally, right? The legal protections for allies aren't always so strong. As you heard me talk about these different laws, I kept referring to your status in one of these categories, your membership in one of these categories. So allies don't generally or don't always have that status. So some laws, for example, our ordinance would allow you as an ally to have a file complaint on behalf of a member of the LGBTQIA+. But if you were the one discriminated against because you are an ally and you expressed your viewpoint of support, it's unclear whether a lot of these laws would protect you. As a lawyer, I'd like to say that there might be some freedom of speech, First Amendment protection, but there, it's, it's iffy whether there would be protection under these ordinances and federal laws because your membership as an ally is not in one of those categories. So those are my first thoughts. Thanks so much for listening and I look forward to additional discussion. Thank you. Do, do any of our other panelists have anything for that question? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> our next question is, to what extent can school employees support the LGBTQIA plus community? For example, wearing logos, joining advocacy groups, using pronouns, or classroom decorations? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, Emily Chavez, she, her pronouns. And um, so I am um, gonna speak about um, what uh, what protections we have within the public schools. Um, I am a school board member, I was elected this past spring. So my first six months or so, um, but I am very happy about some of the things that we've been able to push forward thus far. Um, and I will say anything that's happening now, um, you know, to protect our LGBTQ plus students and, um, and families and staff comes after many years of many people of, of pushing for change and, um, and uh, you know, many, many community efforts um, to move things forward. So um, I wanted to give a little bit of context um, about our, um, our public schools. Um, and so um, I also wanted to mention that I, I did speak with our uh, chief of staff, DPS chief of staff, Tanya Giovanni, um, about um, some of these uh, questions and everything to gather some information, as well as our executive director of equity affairs, Kelvin Bullock, uh, Dr. Kev Kelvin Bullock. And, um, and so um, my answers are informed by um, what they shared with me as well. Um, so last year in our, we have um, a, a student climate survey um, report that um, we, we do. And um, this uh, climate survey, um, went out to seventh and 11th graders. Um, so this is from fall of 2021. Um, so um, with, with that survey, we found that 18% of our seventh graders um, reported that they identified as LGBTQ+. And another 18% said, um, in answer to the question of how they identified in terms of their sexual orientation, I don't know. Um, so presumably we're are somewhere, you know, kind of questioning that. Um, in terms of the 11th graders, 20% of the 11th graders identified on that survey as LGBTQ+. And another 10% said, I don't know. So that's 30 to 40% of students who either identified, um, and again, this is 7th and 11th graders, um, who identified as LGBTQ+, or, um, or weren't sure about their sexual orientation. Um, so just to give a little context here. Um, but in answer to this question about what employees can do, um, employees can actively show or demonstrate their support for the LGBTQIA plus community um, by uh, wearing um, logos, as it says, or uh, joining advocacy groups. Um, and in terms of using pronouns that students prefer or staff prefers, that's something that um, not only teachers um, or staff can do, but we would expect our, our staff and, and teachers to do. Um, we do have, um, 
you know, policy in place. We had guidelines um, previous to this, but we have um, recently moved that into uh, board approved policy that, um, that makes it explicit that we expect that our staff will um, will support the if a if a student or a staff member changes their pronouns um, uh, and and uses different pronouns than they were using pre previously, then um, we do expect that our employees would use the chosen pronouns of that student. Um, and um, in terms of classroom decorations and things like that, um, that would be appropriate to um, share that to to demonstrate that our uh, staff is identity affirming. And that's part of our equity policy as well. Um, we have a racial and educational equity policy that um, that asserts that we um, we want our our classrooms and our schools to be identity affirming. Um, we also I wanted to mention recently added a, a piece in our um, in our policy the LGBTQIA plus and gender supports policy um, that it, that makes it explicit that um, curriculum which is affirming is welcomed. Um, or in our in our classrooms, and so um, and so with that, you know, classroom um, decorations may go along with that that affirming curriculum. So um, that is something that we we support, and um, and we feel like it's part of. Uh, uh, and I can say I think it's important in supporting our students and and making it clear that we we support their identities and uh, believe them about who they are. I have a follow-up question. How do you, how will you enforce um, your teachers and staff with using your students' correct pronouns? That is something that um, we, I think, honestly, because it's it's new, there are different levels of probably um, knowledge. Um, and right now, one of the important things is um, is training and, and more education. Um, you know, I often say how um, I myself was was a teacher before I did a Master of Arts in Teaching program. Teaching LGBTQ students was not part of my curriculum for many, you know, for many educators, for many administrators. Um, we did not necessarily receive that in the curriculum. Um, and and so um, I am queer and I, you know, I've been out for a long time. This has always been a passion of mine to um, make space. I came out as a high school student um, myself and had that experience, but I also coming into the field of education, wanted to support the many queer and trans students that I had or questioning students. And, um, and so um, just to say, you know, that's something that of course I, I brought into my work, um, but not everybody has that background. So with that, we need, um, we need training. And that's something that we are expanding now. Um, so I appreciate that question. Um, so all counselors and social workers have re uh, received training on um, the, the gender support guidelines, which are now policy. Um, and they were the, the first group for getting that training about supporting LGBTQIA plus students. Um, and, um, and so we are, uh, principals also received that training um, last year. Right now, we are working on um, developing a board level training uh, and an upper administration training, um, and we've uh, developed an you know an outline for it. But that is, we hope, will kind of set a standard um, for and give a context for how we support students, um, and um, and that will be something that we expect will kind of um, will be carried out um, to all members of our staff eventually. Um, also, part of our um, Equity 501 um, training um, does, you know, raise the, the um, just look at this student climate survey data and talk about equity um, on the basis of sexual orientation and gender. So, um, so it is something that, you know, we're, we are increasing, but part of that is going to come with education. Now, um, beyond that, if, um, if someone's pronouns are not being used, um, someone is neglecting to correctly, you know, um, use a, a child's pronouns or or a staff member's pronouns. Then um, that that individual or a parent can, you know, share that with the principal or or, um, or someone in HR if, if it's a staff member. And um, I would encourage them to, you know, to call attention to that. It is part of our policy that we respect the, you know, the pronouns and the identity um, of those individuals. Um, so. You know that is that is something that's an expectation, and through you know that kind of 
education piece, we hope everybody will um, come on board with, um, you know, ident affirming identities in all ways. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Our next question is, do educational pro professionals have the right to use the student identified pronouns? I believe you might as well. <laughs> um, and then can parents keep children out of school clubs or alliances that support LGBTQIA plus individuals? In the independent school system, um, independent schools are a little more progressive. That's why I like to use the word progressive. When it comes to uh, activities that are done throughout the school day, if the student is present and the parent has not notified us that the child will not be present, they participate in whatever activity it is. If there is an extracurricular activity, such as we have GSA at the school that I'm a member of, which is our Gender Sexuality Alliance, if there is an after school activity and that student parents does not wish them wish for them to participate the parent has the uh, ability to remove the student but if the student is on campus during that activity they participate um, and within the public schools um, it depends on whether the club requires parental consent or a particular activity requires parental consent um, so for um, for you know your high school students um, in my experience, um, when I was a teacher um, 10 plus years ago um, in Durham Public Schools, um, I was had the honor of being a, a co-advisor of the first GSA at Hillside High School. And um, and that was a club like other clubs where there, there wasn't um, like any parental consent that was required. Um, now with the um, younger students, with elementary students, um, what my understanding is that uh, kids and parents tend to be um, on the same page about that. And um, and so um, there are some rainbow clubs starting at school, at elementary schools, um, but um, there is more parental involvement at, at that level. Um, now, if there was some discrepancy or parents were, um, you know, not feeling comfortable with their student um, participating in a GSA or another type of club like that, um, then I think you know, a lot of it is, again, just having that conversation. Um, we want our students to feel supported. And so, and in general, we want our, um, you know, there to be a good, uh, strong communication between the schools, um, school staff and, um, and the parents. And so I think, you know, talking through that would be important rather than just sort of a, you know, a black, a black white <laughs> can or can't. Um, but I think that's part of, you know, having our schools are communities. So, uh, you know, our parents are part of that as well. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to check in with you guys. Or do you have any additional questions? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's start right now. <laughs> you go ahead. So my question has to do with uh, Has school sex education been expanded to address the needs of non heteronormative participating youth? And if not, can school staff direct youth to other resources such as the LGBT Center of Durham for such needs? Do you want to start? So, uh, again, like I said, I work with the independent school system. So when we don't typically do like the public schools where they have the traditional sit down, fifth grade, you're going to have the sex education, the birds and the bees. A lot of our um, information or talks with students about sexuality, we start in our lower school, which lower school starts at TK. Of course, we're not having those conversations with our pre-K kids, but typically first grade, they are aware that everyone is different. They're aware of, okay, these, we tell them to use the correct name for body parts. Like every male has, you're not going to say, I have to go pee or this is my cat. You're going to use correct body part names. Um, we also discuss um, uh, transgender and what that means. So a lot of our first grade, second graders know this terminology and they know how to use it. Um, but there isn't like a formal sit down like you would see in a public school in the fifth grade where there is a sex ed class. They just are getting bits and pieces based on their um, age group starting in like kindergarten or first grade. Um, it's funny that you asked that question because I, as uh, mentioned in my bio, I'm in the Master of Social Work uh, program right now. And we were just talking about this um, today um, and this afternoon. Um, but in, um, I would need to get back to you with more specifics about Durham Public Schools and, and our uh, processes around sexual education. We do, um, I think that there's nothing preventing teachers from mentioning LGBTQ 
plus identities um, in any class, including health education, which includes sex, sex education. Um, that said, um, I don't, I, I'm not sure what exactly, what all of our curricula um, looks like right now. So I'd have to get back to you about that, but I'd be happy to do more um, investigation on that to share with you. If I could add to, I think that we're also at a point of um, tension with some of those questions um, and the questions about curriculum, right? We had the, it was the house that uh, presented the bill, uh, Stop the Sexualization of Children's Act. And then it went to the Senate, the Senate made some amendments, it went back to the house. Um, so we'll, uh, sorry, that was in the state. So um, we could see with the start of the legislative session that just happened, that kind of get back, brought back up and some movement on that. Of course, uh, Governor Cooper has said he's going to veto it, but you could be seeing more and more discussions, um, and, and we should be discussing what that could mean for, for our children, for our um, state schools. And then on the federal context, there is, so in the, in this, in North Carolina, it was uh, parent parental rights. Parent, uh, uh, yeah, but yeah. Let me. I have. I have. It. We they called it the parents' bill of rights. Parents' bill of rights. And then on the federal level, it was the stop to the sexualization of children act. But but both sort of <laughs> dealing with trying to keep. Um, really issues of, of being transgender and sexual identity and sexual orientation out of the curriculum. And so no decision has been made, but I would encourage you to sort of keep abreast of that stuff and, and certainly engage civically if you can with your lawmakers. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. You talked about the pronouns and um, how they should be used. What if someone just didn't want to use the pronouns at all? Is it okay if they use that for the name? Or would that not be okay? For instance, if a student didn't want to use pronouns at all. Or a teacher or whomever. Or teacher. Um, yes, we in in our case, um, I think we would just work with that person. That is a choice. Um, you know, some people choose not to use pronouns. And um and there, um, that's something where with employees as well, um, there could be, you know, just um, th that's something that we could address. Um, we have had, um, we have had employees who have transitioned or um, have had, you know, different experiences as far as um, uh, coming out in, in different ways. And so, um, or, you know, teachers who might come to us or staff who might come to us and there are, you know, they don't, use pronouns at this point. And so um, there are different ways we can have those conversations and, uh, and uh, accommodate that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I would just add that if you're not going to use pronouns, make sure you're asking them what they like to be referred to as. Because usually it's not, sometimes it's not the name that's on their birth certificate. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for us? Some questions Any, online? Yeah. No. Um, we covered everything. <laughs> um, how can we help LGBTQI plus students and staff feel empowered and heard like in their everyday interaction? Um, I think it all starts with building relationships with students, um, creating that safe space. That's like one of my jobs at Triangle Day School is being that person where they know if they have an issue, it's a judgment-free zone. I also think the biggest thing is people think it's not a big deal, but respecting their pronouns. Um, even the younger kids, as, as grades low as you know, third and fourth graders, they have that right to, to their preferred pronouns. In the independent school system, and maybe you can talk about the public school system, um, when it comes to teachers, faculty, staff, when it comes to student preferred pronouns, that's what we enforce. Uh, and the biggest thing with that, a lot of people say, well, what if the parent doesn't agree with that particular pronoun? Everything that we do is rooted in what's best for the child. So, because uh, a lot of, I mean, we think about it, a lot of LGBTQIA students may not have even had that conversation with their parents. So it's more so about building that relationship, letting them know that this is a safe space. This is a place where there's, there's a judgment-free zone. 
We're going to respect those pronouns. And if your parents don't agree with them, we can figure out a way to let's have a conversation with your parents to see if we can come to some kind of meeting on the minds. Um, also, in the independent school system, parents do not have to be notified about children's uh, preferred pronouns. We believe in prioritizing confidentiality to protect the rights of the student. And, um, okay. um, in both the independent school system and the public school system, is there anything that's asked about in reference to how a prospective employee may uh, view or respond to an identifying student to where that could potentially minimize the future potential issues in the classroom or around the building as a whole? Say that one more time. If the, say, yeah, say yeah. one more time. <laughs> so, is, is there any um, conversation within like the interview process for mm -hmm. the and the business school system as to how prospective employee may do or support the community that could potentially, um, I guess, give an understanding for any future issues that may come about to where you all would have an understanding for in that basis of, I guess, getting hired? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say um, with the public schools, the teachers are hired at the school. So it's, um, you know, usually there's um, a committee of, of folks at the school level who are interviewing. And we don't have, um, to my knowledge, we don't have a standard question that, well, first of all, it's not mandated that everybody, that everybody does their interview process in the same way across the schools. Um, but I, I don't think that um, at this point we have like a standard question along those lines. I think it would be up to the to the members of the school community who would be asking the, um, a question like that. Um, I think your 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 question um, and maybe a point within it is well taken um, because I do think um, you know I would I would love to see that you know when we have educators coming in and and staff in general that um, they are. Um, affirming of our students in all kinds of ways, have a commitment to racial equity, have a commitment to LGBTQ plus equity, um, all of that. And, and so I think, um, I can't speak on all the schools. They Some of them may ask questions along those lines, um, but I think also perhaps all of our um, educators, I, I'm hoping that with this policy, it makes it more clear that on a board level, we fully support LGBTQ plus um, identities. And so, um, that educators themselves or principals can feel um, more empowered to ask a question like that um, and, and feel that it would be appropriate because we want our students to be affirmed. Um, so that's a great question. As far as, I'll speak specific, specifically to my school. Um, so we have a multi-phase interview process. So they come on campus, they spend the entire day at our school and they do step lessons. They do a interview with our head of school they meet with me, um, the DEI director, they'll meet with our counselor department. And then as an admin team, we come together and we say, okay, this is this candidate's strength and weaknesses. Do we think that this uh, candidate can be um, a key part of our community? Are they gonna be warm and welcoming? Um, when I meet with candidates, typically I ask them about um, modifying lessons. How do they diversify their curriculum? Ask them about how do they feel about using um, different gender pronouns? I ask them, um, how do they feel about students from different racial backgrounds? I come up with kind of, you know, a summary of that particular candidate in a yes or no. Thank you. And can I answer your question as well too, just about the general question about supporting LGBTQ students? I was gonna say, you know, one major thing is just not making assumptions. I think when someone walks in the door, mm -hmm. we, you know, often do that or kind of conditioned to do that. But, um, you know, one thing I think is like, I'll, um, you know, I like to introduce myself and say my pronouns because you don't know what my pronouns are just, you know, from looking at me. And um, and so not making assumptions about students, also about families, you know, um, we don't know, we have a variety of family structures and compositions in our schools. And so um, that's important too, not assuming that every kid has um, a mom and a dad or, um, yeah, just leaving it at that. There are so many different ways that people have family. And um, I would say, you know, affirming our staff also so our, our students can have those role models too. Um, so I, you know, I think that's, I think that's important for our students to see that there, there are um, LGBTQ plus individuals. And also um, we haven't mentioned this, but a, an important piece of this 
this whole all of this work to me is is intersectionality. People are not of one identity. We, um, you know, our school district, and I make this point often, is um, is about eighty percent students of color. So we, you know, most of our queer and trans students hold multiple marginalized identities. And so, um, and so we, you know, we need to be aware of, and when we're talking about culturally responsive curriculum and all of that, it, you know, there are multiple ways that um, multiple identities, multiple experiences that we need to be aware of students coming in the door with. So um, again, the curriculum piece I think is important. There are so many good books now <laughs> that weren't around 10, 20, you know, 30 years ago. Um, and, um, and that's really awesome. Like our, you know, there are great books about non-binary kids, trans kids, um, different families, um, queer families and all of that. And so those are really great ways to, you know, to affirm our students and, and to teach other students too and normalize LGBTQ plus identities, because the reality is they've been invisibilized a lot of times. That's, it's a private thing. It's a, you know, I don't care what you do in your household kind of thing, but these are identities. It's not just um, you know, this is not about teaching kids about sex or anything like that. This is about um, this is about affirming people for who they are. So, um, and then again, those clubs. You know, I think the having um, clubs where where students can be affirmed, um, GSAs, um, gender and sexuality alliances, all of that. Um, you know, those are some of the um, those are some great things that we can do to affirm our students and make safe spaces or safer spaces for them. Thank you. I see we have two questions online. Okay. The first question, where can residents apply pressure to further increase protection for queer people in public schools? Hmm. Let's see. Do either of you have an answer to that? <laughs> about like <having> my <laughs> I'll start with Bryce. Um, no, I, I think, you know, so one of the changes recently in 2018 uh, was General Assembly now allows um, municipalities, cities, and towns to fund, um, to help fund public schools. Um, and that was, you know, a 2018 um, law change. And so to the extent that uh, towns and cities can be more informed about what schools are doing, what's going right, or what's, you know, troubling at local schools and informing your, you know, your local officials about that. But then you would, you know, hope that that might inform them and their decisions of where some funds are allocated. So I would say that on a sort of meta level is one of the ways that you could get involved and put, you know, engage civically. I think, um, you know, um, Demetrius, you mentioned relationships, like as yeah. the, you know, kind of cornerstone to this work. And that's what I think of. I think that, um, you know, whatever your identity is, letting teacher, your kids' teachers know, or um, letting, um, you know, administrators know, letting school staff know that you, um, you know, you want to see um, affirming curriculum or um, affirming practices in the schools, regardless of what your identity is or your student's identity. Um, I think that's where people, um, you know, whether they're queer, trans or, or not, can just be, um, have solidarity in this. And um, and I think um, making spaces for stories is important too, because I, I really think a lot of people are moved by, you know, by stories. Um, and, um, you know, I think, I think a lot, you know, there's policy change and there's also cultural change. And I talk about this a lot too. I think that in some ways this is, you know, this is a process where, um, I, I mean, obviously I believe policy really matters and it makes a difference. Um, you know, I, I don't remember the exact statistic, but after, um, after gay marriage was legalized, then the, uh, suicide, um, rates of, of, uh, LGBTQ youth went down. And that says a lot, <laughs> just having, you know, just having that as um, like a, a large affirming, you know, um, option for people, whether they want to get married or not, um, is, was uh, made a big difference. So policy change absolutely matters. And we have to keep um, making policies that will make a difference in people's lives and set expectations for what, how we think people should be treated. And at the same time, this is a cultural shift as well. So I think that's where the education piece in letting people know what you want to see. Even if you, you know, you come to your kid's school and um, 
to volunteer, you can bring some of those books that we're talking about, or you can, you know, you can um, just let people know that you, you're an ally or you're a member of the community and you want to see um, this kind of uh, work in the schools. So um, that's what I would say. But if you also want to be in touch with the board, <laughs> we are accessible as well. Um, and um, and I think, you know, hearing your viewpoints and just letting people know how you feel is important too. And um, and I'll just say, you know, um, our emails are all uh, public and, and all of that. And um, we also have public comment at our meetings and people have, you know, raised their voice that way. That's not as accessible to everyone, but it is um, available. Um, so I'll leave that there. Another piece I was going to say, Emily, is uh, I think one of the biggest pieces is a lot of people don't like to do this, but self-reflection, yeah. checking our own biases. I also think uh, we have to have an understanding that marginalized groups in this country have markedly different life experiences. And once we all look at that, and I'm not just talking about race, I'm talking about gender, all religion. Um, once we check our biases, then it's easier to step into the world and say, okay, how can I educate myself so I can educate others? Because if you don't check your bias, any education or work that you do is in vain. I also think that um, with the younger generation, we need to let our kids know what rights they have. This, these are the rights you have as a member of the LGBTQIA um, community. This is a, a right that you have as a person of color so that our children, when they do get into these situations, they know what rights they do have legally and they know how to protect themselves. And our, our last question on the Zoom. Okay, how are schools supporting disabled, IDD, autistic, and other disabilities with different representation needs? students to learn and affirm their gender identity, sexual orientation, and self-advocacy, including IEP formation and documentation, consent, and body anatomy. Mm. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic question. What? Oh, I don't think it's for me. It's for the schools, right? <laughs> So now, a lot of the independent school systems, we have what we call learning specialists. I'm pretty sure you guys probably call them like interventionists or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we have uh, learning specialists. So at the beginning of the school year, whether you're a new student or a returning student, there is a meeting with the parent to go over either we don't call them learning, we don't call them 504 plans or IEPs, we call them learning plans. And we take, if you come from a public school into the independent school system, you take your IEP or 504 plan and we look at it and say, okay, how does this fit into our school community? What modifications can we make to make sure that one, this child feels supported? Um, with our learning specialists, we have learning specialists and literacy specialists, and they do small group or either like classroom immersion where they're in the classroom working with those students. So those students are not feeling like they're being singled out. They actually are getting the same lessons that their student, their peers are getting, but on like a smaller group setting. Um, we also, modify those learning plans on demand. So it's not like, oh, you only get to review those learning plans twice a year. If we realize that something we have in the plan is not working for that student based on what the parents are saying, what the teachers are saying, we modify them in the moment. Um, I would say in the public schools, um, well, this is another, I appreciate the question. This is like another piece of intersectionality. Um, mm -hmm. Our, um, our students with special needs or who have different um, disabilities or are differently abled, um, they, you know, the, in the public schools, it's um, the Exceptional Children's Program. So our EC teachers, just like all of our teachers would, um, you know, are have access to the same like professional development and all of that kind of stuff. And so um, to give you more, deep, I, I wouldn't be able to give you a whole lot of detail right right now, but I would just say this is another area where it's important to understand multiple identities. And, um, and you know, I am generally concerned um, with our, our public schools, um, our, our academic outcomes for um, some of our, uh, the groups that have scored the lowest um, on academic outcomes. Tests aren't everything, but they do show, um, they, they do show uh, some, uh, information that informs us about what our students are, are, are learning and are capable of doing um, and our groups that have, are scoring the lowest and it's not just Durham but our um, Black, Latinx, 
EC, ESL, English as a Second Language, and um, low-income students. And so those are areas where I generally want to want to see us, you know, support our students, create more equity, and um, and help our students to um, to just be able to have all the access that all of our students do. Um, and so um, with the, you asked some, this person asked specific questions about consent, body autonomy, and all of that. That's, I, I don't know all the answers to that, but um, that's something I will ask about. Um, but in general, I'll just say we have wonderful EC teachers um, in our district and, um, and just like other teachers, they are, you know, learning and will participate in trainings, equity trainings, and and the like um, going forward about affirming LGBTQ plus identities. Thank you. I see some questions. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so this is more of a legal question. Hmm. Um, <laughs> how you see is it's I guess it's more of like the amount of power that the the legal group in the city of Durham has. Like, how do the these expanded protections function for a person who claims to have had their employment terminated, hindered, or exploited mm -hmm. due to their LGBTQIA plus identity or presentation. Okay. Um, so, so before you answer that, can I add to your question? How do we that as well? Like, you know, how do you verify that a person is a part of a community and they have said discrimination? So how do we verify that they're part of yes, like, what are the classes? Is there a thing that they've been discriminated against? If you are claiming that you are part of the LGBTQI community, I don't think anyone in the city would like prove it to me, right? No, that is your identity and you are coming to the table telling us that is your identity and we're going to respect that that is how you identify and that is who you are. So that that's an easy question to answer. That one um, is a bit more complicated, not complicated, just there's more information. So our investigators, so let's say you, you call in to the number, the human relations number, which I'm sure would be provided. And you say, I feel like, you know, my employer didn't uh, promote me because I'm gay or because I'm queer, or because uh, I, you know, I'm brown. Um, so they would take your complaint. There's very specific questions to help them gather information. Um, and then they would issue a notice to your employer and they have the authority to like subpoena records from the employer. So it's a pretty like formal investigation process. It's not a he said, she said, it is let's, let's get records, let's uh, request information to conduct an investigation to, to get to the facts. The goal, of course, is at that, at that point is to figure out what happened, to figure out if a discriminatory act occurred. If they determine it did, the city goes from being neutral investigator to now having made a determination that discriminatory act occurred. And then that's where we take action on behalf of the employee to help enforce their rights. Um, but I'm more, we would be more than happy to provide you like policies and procedures that are many pages long that lay out that investigation process, sample ways that we request information from employers, what questions usually are asked, they interview witnesses, they look through like, for example, if you're claiming you didn't get promoted, what did your employee, you know, how did your employer promote last year? Did they follow that same process? Did someone who had the same experience as you get promoted or someone that less than you get promoted? And what was that justification? So again, it's it's fact finding. Um, it's a pretty formal investigation and they do a really good job about it. Thank you. Our next question here. I'm going to change my question to follow up on that. So I'm I'm curious um, if a if a student felt like they were discriminated against, and they um, let's say it's a young child, so their parent is involved in this, mm -hmm. and maybe what what steps can this parent take um, to make sure whoever is uh, making who is discriminating is no longer discriminating and then if they take the steps at the school level or the district level independent level um and nothing is done where then would could the could someone come to the city or you know where where does the parent go to make sure that people are held accountable for um, so certainly for charter schools and non-public schools, we'd encourage you to come to the city. Um, and and I will say, and I 
you can nod your head, uh, Latoya, if you agree, but I don't think that we require folks to go through all of the processes internals to the school because we recognize sometimes with these issues, that's really hard to do or you're not getting anywhere. As I mentioned, sometimes we understand that a resolution isn't like an amicable verbal resolution is impossible. Maybe we're beyond that point, right? And we recognize that. So I wouldn't say that you have to go through the channels of the school all the way before you come to the human relations division for non-public and charter schools. For the public schools, of course, I'm sure Emily will speak to what processes might look like there, as well as, like I mentioned, there is like the Department of Education Civil Rights Division that handles that, you know, sort of holds schools accountable as well. That's that's why they're there. I think, um, and you're <laughs> familiar with obviously the um, yeah Title Nine um, acts, but beyond that, we um, I would say. Um, I, I mean, we have an appeals process when there is not, um, when there is an action taken that an individual, a, a student or a parent um, or a staff member doesn't um, agree with. And those appeals, um, if they, um, they would go through the administration and then eventually come to the board. Um, and so um, I would say <clears throat> that there would probably be, um, if, if it if one felt that it was not handled within the the other channels that at the school level or the administrative level, then I would say um, there would probably be an appeals process and then would be would come to the board. And when people sometimes um, if board members um, have already are are sort of already privy to all the details of a case, then we need to recuse ourselves when that appeals case comes to the board um, for decision for a decision. Um, but, uh, you know, that would probably be where things would go, um, for staff or student, a staff or student matter. I would also add now that I've consulted my notes, um, other places that would be great as legal aid has a right to education project. Um, so we definitely would want to connect folks to that Southern, you know, Southern Poverty Law Center, ACLU, of course. Um, the North Carolina Department of Administration has a division on non-public education. And so if you were looking at, you know, having concerns or a complaint on a non-public school or a charter school, that would likely be the division. And then there's, of course, the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. So a lot of entities, I know, I'm sure there'll be a list of them provided. Thank you. I see we have some more questions from online. So can we get those? Okay. In regards to making sure people know their rights, where can students or their families go to learn their rights around access to bathrooms, playing on gender um, sports teams, being called the correct name, pronoun, et cetera? Oh, you. Okay. Um, so, we have quite a few options. So uh, our school is part of the National Association of Independent Schools and they have a handbook. And it's literally a handbook that just talks about um, some rules, regulations and policies in regards to supporting students that are transgender or identify as members of the LGBTQIA community. Also, each individual school typically has policies in their own handbook that state, okay, this is what occurs in this particular situation. We also have what we call um, gender plans in our school. And if there's a student like uh, that is in the, I don't know, hypothetically fifth grade, and in that building, we only have male and female bathrooms. Um, we come up with a plan with the parent at the beginning of the year that has a place where that student is allowed to go to the bathroom, whether it's the faculty bathroom in that building, whether it's to the next building over the middle school bathroom. And that's a plan that's discussed with a DEI director, counselor, parents, student, and then it has whoever their teacher is. Um, but there are multiple places um, in the independent school system where they can go to find how they're supported and the different policies we have in place. Um, and for, for DPS, um, I would encourage um, someone to look at our the policy that's um, now in place. So it, again, it's called the LGBTQIA plus um, and gender supports policy. Um, the, the numbers are, it's uh, 1735 slash 4035 slash 7235. 
um, if you want to look it up. This is all public. So um, all of our pub policies are, are public. Um, and um, if you go to the DPS website, you can get to, um, to our policy manual. But this has um, details on uh, name changes, um, bathrooms, sports. Um, so with with sports, we there are some sports at the um, upper level that are dictated. Uh, the rules are dictated by the North Carolina High School um, Athletics Association, and those um, uh, the district um, cannot necessarily change. That's a that's another area, honestly, for exploration is is sports um, and how you know LGBTQ affirming, trans affirming, especially. Um, they are, but in any case, um, if it's a sports not dictated by that, students may um, certainly play uh, according to the the gender that they identify as, and um, and there are other things about um, again if there's a legal if there's a change in, in one's name in one's chosen name or preferred name, um, and then if there's a change in one's legal name, um, then that's a another level of sort of um, you know documents and. Um, uh, and uh, the power school database can be changed and updated on all of that. So I would encourage someone to look at the policy um, that is available online and um, and and then see if that that I think that covers all the topics that this person asked about. I'd also say that the you know U.S. Department of Education has really great uh, resources and brochures and posters that are you know very reader friendly. That are guided towards these topics um, and the Department of Education did release a statement in 2021 indicating that you know again discrimination that based on sex includes gender identity and um, sexual orientation so we know that 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 is the stance of that you know federal department um, there was a case in um, I think it was in Virginia but it, it it's in the Fourth Circuit, which means it covers the, the state surrounding it as well, in which um, the Fourth Circuit found that uh, a young man who wasn't allowed to use the, the, you know, the gender appropriate bathroom um, had been discriminated against. And so the, the school board appealed the case to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decided not to hear it which really means that they decided that the Fourth Circuit's holding um, was should stand. So by doing that, I think the the Supreme Court is certainly saying that, you know, not getting to use the bathroom that is appropriate for you is an act of discrimination. And so certainly within the Fourth Circuit, our state, Virginia, Maryland, and surrounding, um, that is the law. Thank you. And we'll take our last question from that Zoom. Okay. How can LGBT plus elders plug into, plug in to assist young women? Is there an organized effort? I think this could help questioning youth have role models for adult youth. Mm -hmm. And if not, yeah. Well, you can volunteer at the schools. <laughs> we welcome that. Um, I, that's also, it's on our website uh, somewhere, but you, and especially now, you know, that we're, Pat, not past, we're at this phase of the pandemic that, you know, we are, um, there are more events within schools and there are, are opportunities to, to volunteer. So I encourage you to fill up that paperwork as a background check involved and all of that. Um, and, um, and yeah, get involved. That would be great. We, um, there are tutoring programs. There are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of community programs as well. Um, and uh, the LGBTQ Center of Durham has a youth center and they have youth activities. And so that would be also another way to, um, to you know, be around LGBTQ youth. Um, but we would welcome your, <laughs> your skills <laughs> in, in the public schools. So um, thank you for asking that question. And I agree, we are, you know, all young people need role models, but I think, um, you know, sometimes our community has really, um, the LGBTQ community has really lacked those role models and um, it's really important that we have them. So there are there are so many, yeah, please come on. <laughs> so many great, wonderful elders in our community. And our final question is, will the city of Durham add protection 
about 1,000 Durham families were evicted last year. I'm concerned about housing discrimination against families. Philadelphia and other cities have prohibited housing discrimination due to eviction. And evic eviction records are often incorrect. That is a great question. Um, and it is something that I think uh, several of our council members um, have, have brought forth. Um, I think it's a policy that is important to, to some of them. Um, you know, again, back to those layers, our, our um, General Assembly is quite different than some of the other municipalities that have passed uh, protection, like basically fair housing discrimination based on eviction records. Um, it is something that we've looked into, um, and certainly I would encourage you to, you know, communicate with your elected officials if that's something that you're, you're passionate about. Uh, I think Durham tries to react to the needs of our residents as best as possible, and, and certainly we have seen um, so many evictions and, you know, need to pr protect our residents um, from fair housing discrimination and protect our affordable housing stock and try to keep people sheltered and homed. Thank you. I'm gonna ask James Davis to come up and close us out for the night. Well, first of all, what I wanna do is just um, ask you all to show appreciation for our esteemed panel. <laughs> And what I don't see often happen in programs is for the panelists to show appreciation for our guests. Uh, I would certainly thank you, uh, those of you in person and those of you who are online for, um, you guys actually made this program possible. Um, there was an interest that was generated through, um, through the communities and you really pressured us to respond to that interest. And hopefully our response was a good response by having this panel discussion slash forum. Um, but it seems to me that this hour plus um, time we spent together was not really enough um, to get through all of the issues and questions that you may have. Um, so continue to put the pressure on us to, uh, to respond. Um, with that, I'm gonna go through a quick list of, of persons or organizations that we want to um, give um, thanks to for helping put on this program. Um, that includes the Triangle Day School, um, Durham Public Schools and the School Board, um, the Durham City Attorney's Office. Uh, with regards to actually putting together the logistics of this program, I definitely want to thank the LGBTQ Center of Durham, um, the Rainbow Collective for Change, um, and um, for hosting this event here, um, the Holton um, Career and Resource Center, of course, um, um, DPR, the Department of um, Parks and Recreation. Um, but last but not least, uh, there was quite a bit of reference to the Human Relations Division of, um, of the City of Durham. And so we have two very important persons who play roles in the Human Relations Division with us today. They're very quiet. Um, <laughs> the first person I'm going to recognize is Mr. Phil Jordan. He's our Senior Human Relations um, Manager. And the person I'm saving last, definitely not least, is Miss Latoya Battle. She is the main person who made this program happen, and she serves in our human relations division as well. Miss Latoya Battle. And with that being said, um, what I want to do is close out. You know, Google does a lot of amazing things, right? So we opened up with Constance Stansel talking about humanity. Right, so I looked up how do we show humanity. So I'm just going to give you a few of the um, many items that were listed in Google of how to show humanity. Um, one of the things is always look for the good in people. Another thing is love yourself. Love everyone as you would your brothers and sisters. And last but not least, forgive and show compassion. So. With that, I wish you all a very safe trip to your respective abodes as you depart this place. Uh, we do still have some snacks in the back. Um, unfortunately, we do have to get out of here by eight o'clock. So whatever fraternizing <laughs> you do after I leave this front, make it snappy. <laughs> and to everyone a good night.